Well, good morning. My name's Casey Nell, and I'm one of the preaching elders here. If you have your Bibles, let's open to Genesis chapter 39. And I do hope that we're able to play volleyball next week, by the way. Last time we did this, one of the church members, Bill Shimon, he came up to me, and he's like, you and me, bocce ball. And he challenged me to bocce ball, which I absolutely got destroyed. Apparently, he plays bocce ball every week in a bocce ball league. So uh, some of those things going on. Anyway, Genesis chapter 39. Two weeks ago, I walked through the temptation that Joseph found himself in. His master, Potiphar's wife, uh, was pursuing him to sleep with her. And we read in verse 10 that she spoke to Joseph day after day, and he would not listen to her. We saw that Joseph responded by appealing both to the horizontal of how he would love others, but also to the Lord of how he would love the Lord. He said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph had decided beforehand whom he would live for. And that was a a question that I posed last two weeks ago to you is, who have you decided to live for? We all have to know that in advance because you can't decide in the moment often who you're going to live for. And I discussed how often we get into trouble when we give our time and attention and thoughts to things we should not. It leads us astray. I, I shared the illustration of donuts that if you're, you're not wanting, and that was something that I had shared about in my own life, that I wasn't doing that, but I had given myself over to that. So as soon as I had an opportunity, I gave in. Eventually, they will capture and ensnare us anything we give our thoughts, attentions, and our minds to. So this morning, we're going to pick up in Genesis 39, 11, and pick up on the rest of this account. It says, one day, when he, Joseph, went into the house to do his work, and none of the other men were there in the house, she caught him by the garment, saying, lie with me. But he ran, he left his garment in her hand, and fled and got out of the house. What a sight that would have been. We're, we're not sure what was underneath the garment. It says, as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Go down to verse 19. As soon as his master heard these words that his wife spoke to him, he said, this is the way your servant has treated me. And his anger was kindled. Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. Now, there's speculation here that even Potiphar did not believe the account of his wife because punishment for rape would have been death, not imprisonment, especially of a slave. And so it's possible that Potiphar had doubts based upon seeing Joseph's character for 11 years. But he had to do something Because this accusation had been made publicly, and so it was really a lose-lose situation for Potiphar. He was going to lose an incredible great man who was leading his home that he maybe believed, but he couldn't let those accusations stand that his wife had made without doing something. Regardless, the outcome was the same. Joseph was now in prison. Skip down to verse 21. We read this. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and great favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were with him in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. Again, we see Joseph with God's blessing quickly moving up the ranks at whatever situation he's placed in. But the problem continues to arise, and it's not due to any fault of Joseph's. And it seems like a net overall loss, how he continues to move from bad to worse. 
He was the favored son, and then he was sold into slavery. Then as a slave, he worked his way up to second in command in Potiphar's household. Then he was accused of something he didn't do, and he went from being a head slave to a prisoner. And now he's moved up to the top ranks in prison, but the problem is he's where? In prison. It's still a a net loss. It's seemingly a worse situation, and he continues to move up the ranks, but it's always one step farther down than where he just was. It, It doesn't seem like he can get ahead. But again, time and time again in the text, we read these strange words right after these these steps back. Verse 21, the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. This leads to a point we need to all see and remember our first point this morning. The present is not an accurate indicator of God's presence in your life. The present is not an accurate indicator of God's presence in our lives. From all outward appearances, When you looked at Joseph's life, you would conclude from his present circumstances that God was not with him. You would look at someone like this, especially after hearing his story, how he continued to move, and you would think, what kind of sin do you have in your life for this type of stuff to continue to happen to you? This is why we're continually reminded of this truth throughout the account of Joseph. And likewise, for you and me today, your present circumstances are not always an accurate indicator of God's presence in your life. God can be present in your life and you still have issues and circumstances and conflict going on in your life. Joseph could have looked at his surroundings and he could have thought to himself, why has God abandoned me? He's turned his back on me. He could even have had the thought, God doesn't even exist. How could could a loving God allow all of this to continue to happen to me? But we read that the Lord was with Joseph. I want to walk through a few common examples and struggles that we often have that are indicators that we often express as God's presence or lack of presence in our life. These are examples that we often use. Number one, a poor indicator of God's presence is our circumstances. Now, typically, we often judge God's presence in our life based on circumstances. But we look at Joseph's life, betrayed by his brothers, thrown into a pit, sold as a slave, accused of rape, now thrown in prison. It would be so easy to conclude, circumstantially, God's not with him. But we see that that's not the fact because as it seems with every step backwards in Joseph's life, we know the end result that God was actually moving him closer to the throne where he was going to be second in command of all of Egypt. With every step backwards, he was actually moving to the second greatest position in the land. But that's something Joseph didn't know. It's nothing we often know in our life, but That is how the Lord was working. Poor indicator of God's presence in our life, number two, is our feelings. Our feelings change. Your feelings change. And they're not good indicators of what is truly a present reality in our life. If you're married, you know your feelings change often. In your, with your spouse. There may be times where your spouse is furious at you. Have you ever been there, church? Come on, raise your hand. Let's ask it this way. Has your spouse ever been mad at you? Let's raise your hands. You're like, no, that's a trick question. Some of you are going to, I appreciate that hand back there, Tom. Not to point you out, but I saw it. Sorry, Eileen. Hey, Eileen, have you, has, has he ever been mad at you? There you go. Now it's even, one for one. All right, good. So we all understand that we have these feelings that often change where we we can't base things just on how we feel. It's often what I've just been called to do. I'm going to love my spouse as Christ has called me to love them regardless of if I feel they love me the same way I'm trying to love them. That's just the way marriage is. That's the way relationships are. Regarding our feelings, I can have very good feelings about very bad sinful things. Likewise, I can have very poor, bad feelings about very good, godly things. And this is why it's essential for us to know the Word of God 
and apply the Word of God, but also to have men and women in our lives who will speak the Word of God to us and encourage us in the church, encourage us in God's Word. So, moral of the story here is we cannot rely just on feelings. God calls us and commands us to have joy, but we don't always have joy but we pursue to have joy and to be in obedience to the Lord regardless of feelings. Often obedience comes first, feelings come later in the way God's kingdom has been set up. Number three, poor indicator of God's presence in our life is health, wealth, and prosperity or the lack thereof. Oftentimes people think, you have these things, God's with you. If you don't have these things, God's not with you. But sometimes we see in the scriptures, God allows the wicked to prosper. And the righteous, he sometimes has them poor or struggling. Other times he causes the wicked to perish. Regarding his children, sometimes he gives abundant health, abundant wealth. Other times, due to his sovereign purposes, he doesn't. So it's important for us to understand that in the midst of all of this, trials, difficulties, illnesses, blessings, wealth, prosperity, that God is in the midst of all of it. And we need to be aware that God sometimes uses it in different ways. Now, if we are sons and daughters of God and we are going through difficult times, there should be a time in this where we stop and pause and we ask if there's any unconfessed sin in our life. Maybe we need to rule that out. If there's unconfessed sin in our life, something that we continue to do that God says you can't be living this way, we need to think through our life to make sure that the adversity and the difficulties that are coming into our life are not due to unrepentant sin. But if we are seeking to live the Lord and we can't think of unrepentant sins that we're not trying to grow in Christ's likeness and we have struggles coming into our life, then you can be assured God is sovereignly behind these for your good and his glory. We need to know that God is purposefully using all of this to bring us into a likeness of Jesus Christ. We're going to continue with the text and see what happens next here in Genesis chapter 40, verse 1. I'm going to read through this entire chapter so you can just follow along here. It says, Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, their Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the cupbearer and chief baker. And he put them into custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. One night they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in prison, each his own dream and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were very troubled. So he asked them, Pharaoh's officer, what, um, who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we have had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told him his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches, and as soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him the interpretation, This is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you. And please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. And so get me out of this house For I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing wrong that they should put me into this pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream, right? So he sees this dream and he runs to Joseph and says, hey, I had a dream too, do mine next. Here's the dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating out of the basket on my head. 
And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. And that's the end of the interpretation. I mean, can, can you believe that that's just where it ends? Can you imagine the next three nights that he's going to be sleeping on? I mean, this other one was so favorable and he just gets this, this hard, hard truth to swallow. What we see here also is apparently uh, Joseph needed to work on his bedside manner, right? I mean, he has the interpretation and he just tells them straight how it is. And we don't have any follow up to that. We see in verse 20, on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. But Genesis 40, going back to Joseph, it ends with these words yet again. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. This seems like the story of Joseph's life. And maybe you're noticing a theme here in the account. He's betrayed and forgotten by his brothers, but the Lord was, what church? With him. He's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and thrown in jail unjustly, but the Lord was... He's forgotten by the chief cupbearer, but the Lord was with him, showing him steadfast love. So I want to ask us the question, how was Joseph able to continue to trust in the Lord during this time? I mean, this is years and years and years, his life stolen from him. How easy it would have been to become bitter and angry at the Lord. Angry at his brothers, angry at Potiphar, angry at Potiphar's wife. Yet, continually, Joseph seems to be serving and loving and pouring himself out for others. Well, in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, we find a verse that seems to describe perfectly how Joseph was able to handle these situations, including how you and I can handle these situations. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, it says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Now, I want to break this verse into three different points for us to see because there's three things we need to do that we can also see that Joseph did. Point number one, let those who suffer according to God's will. Now, I want to ask us, what does this verse teach us about God's will? What is something that is sometimes present in God's will according to this verse, church? Suffering. What do we often hear in the world that if you're in God's world, there's not going to be any what? Suffering. I mean, that's the message we often hear, even in some churches today, is when you do things God's way, it's always the easy way. Well, Scripture says sometimes when we're in God's will, it's actually a, a way and a difficulty where there is suffering. Now, As Matt prayed this morning, God's way is right and true. His burden and yoke is easy. Taste and see that the Lord is good. All of this is true, but we need to understand the kind of suffering that actually Jesus says his followers will sometimes endure. So we need to also understand that a lack of suffering does not automatically mean God is not with us. So, in fact, we could be suffering because we are exactly in the will of God, doing what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus was perfectly in the will of the Father, and did his life accompany suffering? Yes, we see that. He told his disciples that if they followed after him, they would endure persecution and suffering as they followed after him. But I want us to see that not all suffering is the same. Which leads us to our next question. How do we know if our suffering is according to God's will? 
So many times, we might be sitting down with someone in counseling, and we hear about suffering going on in their life. And a couple of weeks later, I could be sitting down with somebody else, and I hear about suffering going on in their life. There could be two different marriages. One marriage has suffering going on that they have brought upon themselves and they're outside of God's will. Another has a very similar type of suffering going on, but they actually are suffering for the sake of the Lord. But both of the suffering look very similar. It might be the spouse that is after them or criticizing them and attacking them. One is doing it against God's will. The other is doing it in light of God's will. And so we need to understand, well, how, how do we know the difference when we're suffering according to God's will? Well, for starters, let me explain what suffering according to God's will is not. For example, if someone is thrown in jail for breaking the law or being a menace to society or stealing something, they will have suffering. They will have consequences. But these are not suffering according to God's will. They're actually suffering in jail and they are under God's will because he implemented governing authorities to punish them. But this is not following through God's will. In fact, they would be suffering under a different kind of judgment. Suffering according to God, as discussed in 1 Peter 4, is when a follower of Jesus Christ is seeking to live a godly, honoring, loving life, and they are thrown in jail or persecuted simply because they are seeking to do right. When a spouse is seeking to love Jesus Christ and to love their husband, and they are seeking to be good, and that husband is attacking them or persecuting them, they are suffering according to God's will in this way. But if they're a nagging spouse, and they're a critical spouse, and they are an angry spouse, and they're getting that feedback from their husband then this is not suffering according to God's will because they're dishing it out just as much as they're getting it back. And so we need to understand suffering according to God's will is when you are living rightly. And because of right living, because of godly living, because of Christ-like living, you are enduring persecution and suffering. That's the kind of suffering 1 Peter chapter 4 is talking about. So we need to understand that when we're doing right, when we're doing good, when we're loving others, and then because of that, we encounter suffering, it's because you won't deny Christ at work that you miss the promotion or because you're ridiculed by friends and family because you believe in God's truth. That's why you're suffering. Then you can know in those moments you are suffering according to God's will, which leads us to our second point. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator. If you decide to live this way, if you decide to suffer according to God's will in your marriage, at your workplace, at your school, with your family, with your friends, with your spouse, you will have suffering. And it's during that moment you must entrust your soul to a faithful creator. It is during that time we must understand this is purposeful. Because it's not that I am yelling at people that they're criticizing me. It's actually because I'm loving them. Therefore, I know what's happening is in God's hands. Therefore, I'm entrusting the whole situation to the Lord. Because I'm seeking to love others and love God. And this suffering is coming at me. Therefore, Lord, I'm trusting you in the midst of this situation because I'm living how you've called me to live. And as a result, suffering is coming into my life. Therefore, I'm, I'm entrusting you. It's important for us to understand we probably won't know the reasons why suffering is in our life at that moment. We probably won't know where it's leading at that time. We don't have the big picture where all you've done is good and lovely and pure and right, you, can, you, you may not know the reasons why you are suffering, but you can know you are suffering according to God's will. And if you are suffering according to God's will, 
You must entrust your soul to your faithful creator. If you've lived how you're supposed to live, and you're struggling in the midst of difficulty, you can know God is sovereignly behind it. And even though you're going through suffering, this is a good place for you to be. Therefore, we can have hope, not because we know the why, because we may never know the why on this side of eternity. In my, my mom's kitchen growing up, and the sign is still there today, and I think I might have shared this a few years ago, it, there was a sign in the kitchen that said this, I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I remember that sign as a child and as a teenager in the home, and it's still with me today, that if you're living a life that is seeking to love others and glorify God, even in the midst of suffering, we can know who holds tomorrow, even though we don't know what tomorrow has. So we can endure trials when we understand they are purposeful. And they are for our good, and they are for our benefit. But it is disheartening, it is difficult, and frustrating, it is despairing if we think we're going through sufferings for no purpose. That my sufferings don't have a purpose. That would be a difficulty for us that we have to know it is purposeful. For the Christian... We have been told how trials and sufferings are opportunities for growth. We, we read this in James chapter 1. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And steadfastness will have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. As I was preparing the sermon for this week, I was reminded of a quote in the eighth chapter of C.S. Lewis's work, The Screwtape Letters. Now, this is a fictional work. It's, it's a writings back and forth, letters back and forth between two demons. You have the uncle demon writing to the nephew demon, and they're, about, they're talking about how to tempt people away from the Lord how to do their job better and tempt people away from godly things. And so there's very interesting writings back and forth about this that talk about the human condition and sin and godliness. And in this discussion, in chapter 8, it talks about how the Lord allows his sons and daughters to go through difficult periods of time, difficult valleys in their life of suffering for the purpose of producing men and women, sons and daughters who are more like Jesus Christ. So I want to read this from chapter 8. It's quite a long quote, but follow along with me. And again, it's important to understand these are two demons discussing back and forth. So when they talk about the enemy, that is who? God, right? And they talk about their father, that is Satan, right? I'll begin. Now, it may surprise you to learn that in God's efforts to have permanent possession of a soul, he relies on the valleys even more than on the peaks. Some of his special favorites have gone through longer and deeper valleys than anyone else. The reason is this. To us demons, a human is primarily food. Our aim is the absorption of its will into ours, the increase of our own area of selfhood at its expense. But the obedience which the enemy demands of men is quite a different thing. One must face the fact that all the talk about his love for men and his service being perfect freedom is not, as one would gladly believe, mere propaganda, but in fact an appalling truth. He really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself. Creatures whose life on its miniature scale will be qualitatively like his own. Not because he has absorbed them, but because their will conforms to his. We want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons and daughters. We want to suck in, but he wants to give out. We are empty and want to be filled, but he is full and flows over. Our war aim is a world in which our father below has drawn all other beings into himself. The enemy, however, wants a world full of beings united to him and still distinct. 
And that is where the valleys of life come in. He will set them off with communications of his presence, which, though faint, seem very great to them with emotional sweetness, an easy conquest over a temptation in their life they've struggled with. But he never allows this state of affairs to last too long. Sooner or later, he withdraws from them, if not, in fact, at least from their conscience experience, all the support and incentives. He leaves the creature to stand up on its own two legs, to carry out from the will alone duties which have lost all relish and joy. It is during such valley periods, much more than the peak periods, that it is growing into the sort of creature that he desires them to be. Hence, the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which actually please him best. We can drag our patients along by continual tempting because we design them only for the table. And the more their will is interfered with, the better. He cannot tempt to virtue as we do to vice. He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take his hand away. And if only the will to walk is really there, he is pleased even when they stumble. Do not be deceived. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring, but still intending to do our enemy's will, looks upon a universe around them from which every trace of God seems to have vanished and ask why they have been forsaken Yet they still obey. End of quote. What a perfect picture we need to see of what God does. He comes alongside of us. He gives us his presence. And sometimes in life we feel this presence. Have, have there been times in our life where you feel the sovereign, strong, powerful presence of God? Let's raise our hand if you felt, felt that at different times, right? Now, has that presence and feeling continued every day of your life? No, sometimes we have that. Those are those mountaintop experiences. But what they're talking about, experience in our own life, is in the valleys where it feels there is no presence of God. We don't have the feelings. We don't have this all-knowing. It's that moment that they, the demons are talking about where it seems as if God has left us. But we know he never leaves us nor forsakes us. So while we may not have those feelings, God's presence is right along with us. And it's during those moments where we don't feel it that when we are putting on godly actions, we are becoming more Christ-like than ever before in our life. Because it's not based upon a feeling of wanting to do it. It's based upon this is right and true and good. I love this last quote. Still intending to do our enemy's will, that we look upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, and we ask, why? Why have you forsaken me, abandoned me, and still we obey? That is the kind of believer in Jesus Christ we need to be. And that's what Joseph was. That everything had left his circumstances had been taken away and he was in a worst place and he continues to live for the Lord. Going back to 1 Peter, there's one more point we need to see. We've gone through two of the three. 1 Peter chapter 4, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator, number three, while doing good. This last little portion. We see here that as we are seeking to live for the Lord, we sometimes endure suffering. As we're enduring suffering, it's during that time we have to know that this suffering is according to God's will because I'm in the will of God. It's not because of a sin in my life that's ongoing. It's because I'm actually living for the Lord. Suffering is there. Therefore, I'm entrusting myself to God. And while I'm entrusting myself to God in my marriage, at my work, whatever is going on in my life, I'm going to continue to love the Lord 
and love others with my words and my actions and my attitude. It says, when we're going through the ringer, because we are living a godly life, we are called to put on Christ-like actions, put on Christ-like words. We double down on our faith with good actions when we encounter suffering. It's not that we throw up our hands and say, I'm the victim here. All I've done is good, and now I'm getting this, and I'm a victim. That's not what Jesus Christ did. He pursued to love the Lord with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others, even while he was on the cross, he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was loving others even as they were against him. So when trials get difficult, we continue to bless others. We continue to do what is right. We continue to love God and love others in the midst of that. What is it if we only love those who love us? That's not a Christ-like love. What is it when we only love our spouse and pursue our spouse and cherish our spouse if they are loving us how we are supposed to be loved? That's not love at all. That's being self-centered. But Christ-like love is that we pursue that. So we must not become bitter at our circumstances, but continue to do good. We read in Genesis chapter 40 that Joseph continued to do good in whatever bleak situation he finds himself in. He was able to have faith in God and miraculously interpret the dreams of others and they forgot him, but God didn't forget him. So when things don't seem fair in your life and you're seeking to live for the Lord, I want you to know maybe just maybe it's because you are exactly where the Lord wants you to be. And if we find ourselves there, remember you're in good company with Joseph. But more importantly, you're also in the company of Jesus Christ, who Jesus only ever did what was loving to the Father and loving to others. And he perfectly demonstrated love towards everyone all the time, and his life at the end was full of suffering. He was falsely accused. He was slandered. He was dragged to the courts. He was mocked. He was accused. He was beaten. All the while declared innocent 11 times at his trial. Yet he walked in perfect obedience, loving the Lord and others the whole time. He lived out just as Joseph lived out, 1 Peter 4.19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their soul to a faithful creator while doing good. We need to understand these are not indicators and in lack of presence in our life, but sometimes the very evidence of God's presence in our life. As we come to a close, I, I want to open up a time after our last worship song. If, if there's anyone going through something this morning, going through a struggle, maybe there's a, a marriage issue, a work issue, a family issue, something personal where you need counsel, you need prayer, you'd like to have somebody pray for you, or you'd like to set up a time to meet with one of the pastors of the church and find hope and encouragement. Maybe for you, you realize that you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ encourage you right after the last song, we're going to have um, one of our deacons up here at the front. Another one of our elders is going to be up here at the front. I'm going to be in the back foyer where we normally are when the sermon is over, but encourage you to come and talk with one of these individuals. And we would love to find a time either this morning to meet with you, or if it's something that you think would be a little bit later, at least find a time to pray for you this morning and schedule a time a little bit later. And so with that, would you pray with me this morning as we come to a close? God, I pray if there's anyone here who's going through the ringer, they are in the midst of sufferings. Maybe they need clarity. Are they suffering according to your will or because of some things that they have brought into their life? Maybe it's a mix of both. God, I pray that they could find wisdom and counsel and comfort this morning. God, may they be open to, to talk about those things or to pursue prayer afterwards for that. God, we thank you that you are sovereign over all things. 
And that you allow suffering in our life to bring us into more and more obedience. You allow us to go into the valleys of life to become more and more in resemblance of yourself. You did this with Joseph. And while his situations went from bad to worse, continually downward, we read that you did not forget him. God, help us to know that you have not forgotten us either. For those this morning that have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you have not forgotten us, that you dwell within us. Your Holy Spirit lives within us. The same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells and lives in us. Help us to remember that we are not victims, but we are victors. And you have called us to go forth in this world and proclaim a message of victory. And so when we endure suffering, help us to entrust ourselves to a faithful, good creator while continuing to do good. Help us to do this in our marriage, with our family and friends, at our workplace. Even in the church, when somebody gets hurt in the church or they're forgotten about, help them to put on love for others. Help us to be Christ-like. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you were able to come again to worship you one last time this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.